Hello and behind me is Concorde. And while this aircraft needs no introduction, this specific aircraft behind me is actually a prototype and actually holds a record for the fastest flight ever flown in a Concorde. And in this video, I'm gonna take you on a detailed tour of it. First, we're gonna walk around and I'm gonna point out what makes it unique and interesting from the outside. And then we're going to go inside and have a look and then we'll finish up on the flight deck. So let's get into it. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes and some music. These include flight reviews and tours through interesting aircraft in museums. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the British Airliner Collection at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford for letting me film this aircraft. If you're an av geek and in the United Kingdom, this museum should definitely be on your bucket list. Some of the details will be duplicated from a previous Concorde tour in Seattle, but I've added a lot more detail, and this includes a tour of the cockpit as well. Let's start the tour by looking at the incredible Rolls-Royce Olympus 593 turbojets, and specifically now its engine number 1 and 2. It had a complex air intake system that we're going to talk about. Up here was the boundary layer diverter, and this removes turbulent air that travels along the aircraft skin, and you don't want that entering the engine. During takeoff, this ramp door would raise, allowing in the maximum amount of air. But remember, the supersonic air cannot directly enter the engine, so at higher speeds, this ramp door actually moves downwards, creating a shockwave inside the tunnel, which in turn slows the oncoming air. It also starts to compress the incoming air, therefore reducing the workload of the engine's compressors. If there was a sudden engine failure, this ramp would lower as to minimize drag from the engine and direct the air downwards and out through the spool door. Directing it downwards would also create a small amount of lift, helping negate the drag from the dead engine. Air could also enter via the spool door, which also acted as an inlet flap, to provide additional air during takeoff. The engines were really inefficient at low speeds. In fact, during the taxiing to the runway, they could burn at two tons of A1 fuel, which was just under 2% of the total fuel load. But while they were thirsty, they were very powerful. In fact, even at idle, the brakes had to be continuously applied as to prevent the aircraft from rolling, so after landing, they would always turn the outboard engines off to cause less brake wear. At the rear, you have these variable exhaust nozzles, and inside were the afterburning facilities. Engine number one here has the reverse thrust activated, which would direct air downwards and forwards and through this vent here. Now the reheating, which is what the British called afterburners, is where fuel is dumped into the exhaust and the resulting explosion causes more thrust, but obviously at the cost of higher fuel consumption. This was used during takeoff and the climb, but turned off once they reached cruising speed. Now this is quite interesting. You'll notice this fairing in the underside of the fuselage, and this is almost the shape of a bomb or a missile. Now obviously Concorde was a civilian program, and there were murmurings of a military applications, and apparently the blue steel nuclear missile that you can see here underneath the Vulcan was considered. It's always hard to know how serious that rumour was, although it makes for a good story, and this is the internet, so it must be true. But it's certainly interesting that the shapes are similar. And looking here, you have two massive elevons, which function as both elevators, which control the pitch up and down, and would normally be the horizontal stabilizer's job, and the ailerons, which control the roll and hence the turning. And here's another outboard elevon as well. You'll notice that the wing has a slight anhedral, which is a downward slope, as this allowed for greater stability with crosswinds. Now let's mention this wing, which was an Augival Delta wing, which is best appreciated from this angle underneath an Air France Concorde. The wing forms the shape of a triangle, but there is an OG curve in the wing's leading edge, which is found to generate better lift at low speeds than a straight leading edge found on a pure Delta wing. Of interest, the curve was far more subtle than the abrupt angle seen in the Soviet Tu-144, which apparently led to the Concorde's greater performance. As we move forward, you'll see this black section with Roman numerals on the forward part of the wing. Now to test the aircraft's de-icing systems, critical points around the aircraft were painted black, thus making ice more visible, which could then be observed by five cameras located around the aircraft. Inside, you'll see that there was a dedicated station where an engineer would monitor this, and I'll show you that shortly. Now here we are with the nose wheel, which you'll notice is especially tall. Now while the delta wing was effective at high speed, it created less lift at low speed, so to actually get the aircraft into the air, they had to move faster and use a higher angle of attack. 
This means that the nose had to be sitting right up higher than most other aircraft to generate enough lift. But as you know, having played on a seesaw when you were a kid, if the nose is up high, then the tail will droop down. Now as to avoid that striking the ground, the whole aircraft had to be raised up, hence the very tall landing gear strut. The nose wheels were inflated to around 191 psi, in comparison to your car, which would be around 30 to 35. Another complication of the high angle of attack during takeoff and landing would be the view from the cockpit, as it would be obscured by the nose sticking right up into the air. To get around this, both Concorde and the TU-144 could lower the nose to allow the crew to see where they were landing, and then return to the straight position as you can see with this example in Duxford. Due to the high speeds, aerodynamic heating becomes a complication. They used an aluminium alloy called Hydrinium RR58, and the highest temperature that it could tolerate was 127 degrees Celsius, which limited the top speed to Mach 2.02. When the fuselage heated up, it would expand by between 20 and 30 centimeters. To cool both the cabin and the hydraulics, they pumped fuel around as a heat sink similar to the SR-71. So the fuel was used a bit like radiator liquid to absorb the heat and then be pumped back to the engines where it got a lot hotter, albeit temporarily. There was also restrictions on the outside paint as white was better at reflecting the heat. The white paint itself reduced the skin temperature by six to 11 degrees Celsius. In fact, in 1996, Air France briefly painted one of theirs in a blue livery due to a promotional deal with Pepsi, but because of the extra heat, they were advised to remain at Mach 2 for no more than 20 minutes at a time. Now they used that particular aircraft because it was not scheduled for any longer flights with long Mach 2 operations. The paint also had to be a special type that could stretch when the aircraft expanded at speed. And here's one of the two main landing gears. Concorde was the first airline to use carbon-carbon brakes, which handled the temperature better, as remember this had an especially fast landing and takeoff speed, and were also 500 kilograms lighter than the standard brakes. After a typical landing in Heathrow, the brakes were usually around 300 to 500 degrees Celsius. While we're standing underneath the fuselage, I'll take this opportunity to jump to footage from behind, and it really highlights just how small the fuselage actually is. While this obviously reduces drag, it does contribute to very tight conditions inside the aircraft. Now I mentioned the risk of tail strikes before, and this here was to protect the underside and warn the crew of an over-rotation, and to calm down with the yoke. Production Concords, as you can see here, had a longer tail cone and wheels installed that could deploy with the main landing gear. In fact, what's interesting was that there were always rumors of the Soviets getting access to early Concorde designs, and you'll notice that the production TU-144 had a very small tail cone, just like this prototype of Duxford. It was as opposed to the final Concorde design, where the tail grew quite a bit longer, as you can see with this Air France example. So that supports the theory that the Soviets probably did have access to early Concorde designs. You'll notice that there's no APU exhaust in the tail, and that's because there isn't one. It would have been extra weight, and there was already minimal room inside. Because Concorde really only stuck to major airports, there was always going to be a ground power unit which could be immediately attached to it to maintain all of the systems. Keen observers will have noticed that this is a turbojet, rather than the more modern and efficient turbofans. Now the main reason was that newer turbofans were much larger and would generate excessive drag. It's interesting to compare this with the TU-144 once again, and that had both a turbofan and a turbojet engine options. And it's pretty obvious how much bigger the engine and its surroundings are when compared to Concorde. This would obviously cause a lot of extra drag. But the problems with the turbojets were that they were louder, and when the Concorde's engine decisions were made, silencing technology was planned, but they didn't eventuate, resulting in a lot of noise complaints both from the engine and from the sonic booms. Now let's head upstairs and check out the interior and the cockpit. This actual aircraft was the third one built and used for testing. It never carried passengers, but instead had 12 tons of equipment installed, which we'll look at shortly. During flight testing, it reached Mach 2.23, making it the fastest ever Concorde. Now we'll enter via the rear baggage compartment door, and while the main cabin was still fairly narrow, this area was even more so as it tapered towards the tail, providing the most aerodynamic tail end possible. You'll notice yellow wiring all over the interior. In fact, there was over 320 kilometers in this prototype, 
There were over 2,600 sensors all throughout the aircraft measuring pressure, temperatures and other parameters that were all recorded on magnetic tape for analysis after landing. This here on the right is a flight data recorder. Now as with all black boxes, they were painted orange to make them easy to find. This could be ejected by explosive forces if there was a catastrophic unplanned in-flight disassembly. It simultaneously recorded 300 data channels and 5 voice channels on magnetic tape as well. These here on both sides are the intake computers. Now as I mentioned earlier, the Concorde had an extremely advanced variable air intake system that had to rapidly control multiple ramps and vents. Earlier prototypes had an analog control system, but that was inadequate, so it was replaced with a digital system, and this one you're looking at was actually the first one installed in this very aircraft. Now this here is the MEPU, which stands for the Monofuel Emergency Power Unit installed into the tail. Now remember that the Concorde did not have an APU, so this could be used to generate electrical power if there were engine failures. But it did use the highly toxic hydrazine as fuel, and production Concords used a ram air turbine instead, as you can see here, and this would drop into the airflow similar to a wind generator. I mentioned earlier that 2600 sensors recorded various parameters on magnetic tape and this is where they were actually located. Unfortunately, these are replicas as the originals were removed to reduce weight when this aircraft was flown into Duxford's shorter runway. Often engineers, additional flight crews and even VIPs flew on these test aircraft and they would use these seats here. This here is a nitrogen jack. If there was a failure of the hydraulic systems, high pressure nitrogen could be used to lower the landing gear. This here is the eye station. The engineer here could monitor these cameras looking at critical points painted black around the aircraft so that they could see if the ice was forming um, and how effective the de-icing system was. Here's the evacuation light and I'll show you the escape system shortly. As you probably worked out, this section is the main cabin and what's striking is how narrow it is. For comparison's sake, here's footage inside the Soviet Tupolev Tu-144 which was around 50 centimeters wider, and you can check out my tour through that aircraft via the link below. Here's the interior of the passenger Concorde in the Museum of Flight in Seattle, and again, it looks really cramped. I suspect that it was one of the reasons why Concorde was eventually dropped. It was a lot more expensive than first class on a 747 or a 777, yet the seat was no better than premium economy. Yes, the food and drink was vastly superior, but the seats were actually pretty poor. And this view out of the starboard wing is very impressive. If they needed to escape, then there were no slides and the crew would throw this emergency escape ladder out and off the wing. Behind here was a toilet for the crew. Now this down here was the emergency escape hatch, used as a last resort to abandon the aircraft in flight. Once the outer hatch had been jettisoned, the blade on the left would then be extended down into the airflow to protect the person from that airflow that would be travelling at Mach 2 at 60,000 feet, making survivability unfavourable. It's fortunate that this was never used. This here is a periscope-like device called a hydroscope which could be used to look at the underside of the aircraft during flight. On the left here, we have the oxygen system. Now at cruising altitude, the normal oxygen masks would have been useless in the event of a pressurization failure, so this unit also supplied the pressure suits and the helmets. And on the opposite is the flight test observation station. Three crew members here would observe and record various information. You can see here multiple engine parameters for the four engines so that the crew here would know what was happening up front. Again, there's the abandoned aircraft beacon, which could be activated by the crew. And on the other side was a phone to speak with the cockpit or make cabin announcements. This red device here is a cone that would sit on the nose prong when the nose was extended down while sitting on the ground. This monitors cosmic radiation which actually became a problem in Concorde because of the higher cruising altitudes of around 60,000 feet. It was approximately double the flux of extraterrestrial ionizing radiation than a Boeing 747 would have at 40,000 feet. But because the flights were shorter due to the higher speeds, the exposure itself would be shorter, so in the end they decided it wouldn't be a problem. But it was measured in flight anyway, and if the levels were going to be high due to some unusual solar activity, then they would descend to 47,000 feet. Next to that is another escape hatch. Now let's go and check out the flight deck. 
On the left are the many circuit breakers and a seat for another crew member. Now what really stands out is how cramped the whole cockpit is. Here is a VC-10 for comparison's sake and the slightly wider Soviet supersonic airliner, the Tu-144 as well. And as I said, there's many circuit breakers on the wall and a spare crew seat. Normally there will be three crew with two pilots and one flight engineer and let's start by jumping into the captain's seat which was an incredible experience for an av geek like me. This here is the nose wheel control which unlike many aircraft where there's only one on the captain's side, one is mirrored on the co-pilot side as well. Now they had to remember that the nose wheel was around 35 feet behind them which would make coordinating the turn an interesting experience. By the way, it's very cool looking at the Lancaster through this window. As I mentioned earlier, this has a movable nose and visor and the controls were here. It's currently in the supersonic mode and the most aerodynamic. The first detente was to move the visor down into the nose cone. The second stage was to lower the whole nose to 5 degrees for taxi and takeoff and then fully down to 12.5 degrees for the landing position to get the nose out of the pilot's line of sight. Of interest, the crew were trained to land with the nose stuck upwards so they wouldn't have had any view of the runway at all although thankfully that never happened in real life. In fact there was a manual way of an emergency lowering of the nose which was to depressurize the hydraulics and gravity would then drag it down into the nose down position. Directly in front of the captain is the artificial horizon, the compass, the airspeed indicator and the Mach meter. There's the rate of descent indicator, the radio altimeter and pressure altimeter as well. These instruments are mirrored on the co-pilot side. Up here you have instruments for the autopilot and below are the multiple parameters for the Rolls-Royce Olympus engines number 1, 2, 3 and 4. Looking here in the center are the four engine throttles. Forward of those are the reverse thrust levers and behind are extensions of the throttle so that the flight engineer could actually reach forward and adjust the throttle themselves. Down here are four switches for the reheater or the afterburner. We'll move back and have a look at the flight engineer's position which was commonplace in airliners at the time but that job was eventually replaced by computers. This station was organized into zones and we'll go through them in a little more detail once I take a step back as again it really is cramped in here. And up here is the air conditioning system and down here are the engine's instruments. Before I mention the ramps involved in the variable air intake and here's the gauges that display their positions. The center section here is all about fuel management. This here is the center of gravity meter that could be used to help the calculations as fuel was moved into the tail tank. Another interesting issue faced by Concorde's engineers was that when they were traveling at Mach 1, the shock wave moves back along the side of the aircraft and that wave changes shape as they speed up to Mach 2. In fact, it moves the center of lift backwards from when the aircraft is flying at subsonic speed. This leaves the center of lift and the center of gravity in different positions, therefore the aircraft would become highly unstable and want to pitch downwards. You could fix this with aerodynamic trim but then that would create aerodynamic penalties thus affecting speed and fuel consumption. Instead, they installed a fuel tank in the tail cone and the flight engineer would pump fuel back there to move the center of gravity back by around 9 feet. And further back are instruments for the electrical generation. Now the aircraft itself expands by around 22 centimeters due to aerodynamic heating and that lengthening is spread throughout the aircraft. The gap here between the flight engineer's panel and the bulkhead would increase by around 3 centimeters, but then shrink to the size that you're seeing now at lower speeds. There was a story of a flight engineer putting the aircraft's technical manual in this spot and when they landed no one could remove it. The problem was that this document needed to be signed by the crew before and after the flight, so they had to get special permission to take off without signing it, then let the gap grow and slide it out. At high speed, passengers wouldn't want to see the expansion ripping carpet or forming noticeable panel gaps, so the entire cabin floor was placed on rollers so that the fuselage could move separately. And here we are exiting this incredible aircraft. There was a Concorde B planned with larger wings, larger fuel tanks and upgraded engines without afterburners although it didn't eventuate. Of interest, this TSR2 prototype here shared the same engine as the Concorde as did the Avro Vulcan without the afterburner and I have a video of both of those aircraft and many others on my channel so please check them out if you're interested. I also have a really interesting video where I tour through a Soviet Tu-144 and compare it with the production Air France Concorde and it's fascinating seeing the two sitting next to each other. Thanks for watching.